Well, uh, welcome to the second episode of the On the Touchline podcast for season three. And uh, you're going to hear from a familiar voice uh, in this particular episode. So in preparing for season three, uh, something that Aaron Rodgers and I had talked a little bit about was, you know, drilling down a little more into the culture aspect and the philosophy aspect of the teams that we coach and we lead and what does that actually look like? Um, you know, we can, we can tweet about these things, we can talk about them in our own environments, but, you know, part of our duty as coaches is really paying it forward so other people can see our work. And um, Aaron, I'm, I'm really appreciative uh, of you wanting to share your work and sort of your philosophy on the game. And I'll share mine here uh, shortly. But um, so, you know, take a few minutes. Um, the, the cool thing about today's podcast, it's both uh, an audio and video podcast. So we'll release both of those. And um, I guess tell the folks listening or watching this sort of your philosophy on the game of football and how you know, you've arrived there. Has it changed over time? And, um, you know, we'll kind of see where it goes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as we, as we get older and become more experienced, we, we vary kind of our approaches to the game and, and, you know, from a technical tactical aspect and from a, uh, psychological aspect and, and from a physical aspect um, you know, there's so many different things that, that go along with all those things. And of course, from a physical aspect as a college coach, when your season is so, so short, I mean, you start in August and you hopefully end in the latter part of November. And, you know, um, obviously that would take you far into the, to the NCAA tournament. Um, you, and you're playing two games a week. So your training time is limited. So obviously now it's sports science, um, you know, being able to affect and, and help manage the uh, the physical aspect of things. And then obviously technical, tactical, how do you approach the game? Um, uh, how do you want to set up a team? How do you want to build up? How do you want to defend? Um, those things are obviously very important. And some of those things are, are your own personal um, opinions on the game also is it driven by your personnel that you have as well so mm -hmm. as you recruit are you recruiting the people that fit a system or are you putting a play are you putting the best players you can get into a system that suits them so you know those things are all very important um, but one of the things that that I've I've found so vital in in the game and it's taken a long time I think and with maturity and evolution as a as a as a coach and as a person to to kind of to come um, full circle with is to understand the psychological element to approaching the game and and how do we encourage our players to be the best versions of themselves how do we encourage the players to enjoy the process to enjoy what they do and and how do we get them to be the best teammates and not necessarily just strive to be the best player on the team because a cohesive group is an extremely strong group and and that's what we try to do and that's what i try to do on a on a really a daily daily basis and so you know a lot of that comes from um a variation of of the old john wooden quote um of being um a great teammate not necessarily a, a great player and so, you know, we kind of put it down in, into this into this phrase, players who are the best teammate for the team, not necessarily the best player on the team. Because you can win a lot more games when you have 18 players that are pulling for each other and pushing each other to be your best or his best, as opposed to one phenomenal player that sets her his or herself away from the team and doesn't allow that cohesion. And so... Those things for me um, are very, very vital. And so, you know, one of those things is as I was going through um, learning how to be a coach and, and learning how to develop my philosophy and evolving that philosophy was that simple message to the group. And a lot of that came from when I, when I became a head coach of a college team for the first time seven years ago. And my message to the group, when I called all the players 
that I, after I got named the coach and when I talked to anybody that wanted to listen, um, was the message was, I kept saying, we were, we want to win. We want to win. We want to win. And of course, I think you want to win. Every competitive person wants to win. They want to be the best, best that they can be. But I think people started getting lost in my care for the process or my care for people by just hearing that, that word win. And so they wouldn't understand that I'm here for the best interest of them and helping create great people, not necessarily just great soccer players. And so, you know, that was the thing is winning. The only thing is winning. The only thing that the players that you work with um, on a daily basis do that's, is, is that all they think that you think about? Are they only there to help you win or promote your agenda and and that's where I started I mean I've always cared I've not cared any differently today than I did seven years ago about people but the message was different and in and so over the years I started focusing on developing people as the core message not necessarily the message of just winning and we always tried to, I always tried to develop people. It wasn't, it wasn't, that's my drive and my passion as a coach is to help people through the game of soccer. But the message had to change. The desire to win and the desire to create great people was always there, but the message had to change. And so in order to drive standards and push people to excel, we really wanted to make sure that people want to be there, want to be part of that process. And, and so that's where that development came. So, you know, we wanted to focus and I wanted to really change my focus and the message, not just to, Hey, we're going to do everything we can to win, but we're going to do everything we can to develop you as people. And, and so, you know, again, I, I think you don't necessarily have to be the best tactician. A, if, if you surround yourself with good people and B, if you create the environment that players and staff enjoy themselves, so they give their all. And it's interesting. I, I, I was watching a, a video on Netflix and it was taught, it was professional. It was in Spain. I think it was say sueños. It's on, it's either on prime video or it just goes through some professional teams in Spain. And, and I, I have this little quote here. It says happy people work harder than grumpy people. And it, in this, in the, in the six, the say sueños um, documentary or docuseries, one of the smaller teams in the Spain La Liga was doing fantastic. And the owner of the team says to the coach something about how he's just is so, he, he loves how the coach encourages people and inspires people and keeps them happy. And, and he said to the coach, he said, we can do more with happy people because they want to be there and happy people will work harder and happy people want to succeed and more so than if people are just grumpy. And so I, I took that and I thought, you know what, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. What I was trying to, to continue to, to, to communicate with our group. And I thought that was, that was awesome just to see that at the professional. So so then after, you know, after all that, you, and actually I had a, I had a, we do these meetings with our team on a bi-yearly basis. I mean, we, every couple, every semester we go through these, these meetings with our teams and we just, we talk about why we do what we do. And, and, you know, we all talk about the why and why am I doing this? And so, you know, we try, we actually had that, we had one of those meetings today with our team and, and I, continue to encourage our players to create their own personal mission statement, their own personal mission statement on why they do what they do. And, and, and this one is, and this was my coaching philosophy right here is, is to develop student athletes to excel in the classroom, athletic field and community to develop people who drive their value as a person by how they treat others, how they serve their teammates and how they put the team first, not by playing time they receive. Skills learned through competing as a student athlete will prepare the players to be committed and dedicated to whatever they do in life, which will in turn develop women who contribute positively to their communities, families, and professional environments. And so that's why I do what I do. And that's what 
I want every day to to project to our players that that this is what is it this is what it's all about. We are fortunate to be able to learn these life skills through soccer. That's our commonality. Our commonality is coming together because of the love of the game and and the skill to be able to play the game. But we're creating and we're learning and we're growing every day. I grow and learn every day right alongside those those players and and so that that's my personal one and it may change at some point that's what it is now it may evolve and alter as we go through as we continue to go through life and so you know one of the things that I want them to understand is as players and when they come as student athletes every day do you feel joy do you feel joy while you're preparing in the summertime do you feel joy while you're preparing in the winter time and in the springtime in anything that you do in your studies, in your job, if you have an off-season job, and then in soccer, do you look forward to every day? And then do you have someone, something that helps you to enjoy it? Do you have someone that you can lean on, that you can that you can um, bounce ideas off, that you can commiserate with, that you can encourage, that can earn, encourage you? Those kind of things are so so important, um, and that's what we want. That's what we want to gain um, out of each day with each other. Um, and, you know, along those things is that we want them to understand that we value them first as a person and second as a player. And, you know, a lot of that is down to full ownership of the program. And I, and I, li- and I put with guidance on there because I like to think of myself as the guardrails on a bowling alley, on a bowling lane. Because if you're up there and you're throwing that ball down the lane every time and you're hitting a strike, you're doing the right things. You're creating something that's great. But every once in a while, it might slip out of your hands. And instead of letting you go into the gutter, I'm just that guardrail on the, on the bowling alley that kind of just nudges you right back into the middle nudges you right back into the middle and because I don't want I don't want to be someone that micromanages a group I don't want somebody that people only look to me to make the decisions because we have to learn how to make those and we have to have an ownership of those and we have to have have um, responsibility and part of that but understanding that we're still dealing with with 18 to 22 year olds that still need some guidance and mentorship and and um uh, leadership. So that's why we have those bumpers up on the lane and that's what I do. And so in our group, all the players are equal player one to 28. We all share the responsibility of the group from the freshmen to the seniors. There's no freshman jobs. There's no senior jobs. Whatever needs to be done for the team is done collectively together because if we're going to be out there on the field competing and, and fighting and pushing for each other and with each other, we all have to be the same. We all have to be equal because there's no freshman or senior when you're on the field or when you're on the sideline and you're encouraging the group, there's only teammates. And so that's what we do. Um, that's what we do as a, as a group. And, and we all share that, um, you know, just, geez, I'll pitch in and do whatever I have to do. There's no job that I'm, that I've not done or not wouldn't be happy to do and carrying water bottles and carrying ball bags and you name it, I'll do it. Got no problems with that. Um, and then just me personally, I, I love to, I love to greet every player uh, before practice, before meetings, anytime we're together as a group, I love to, I love to greet every one of them. And I know sometimes it gets a little annoying to them because I won't leave. I won't, I won't stop shaking their hand until they look me right in the eyes and I get to smile at them. And sometimes they get annoyed with that because they know it's coming, but I still make sure look them in the eye and I smile at them. And and, and normally we, we have a kind of a, a time that we share together something. Uh, Hopefully we have something fun to share or something exciting to share. We've got a good grade on an exam or, got an internship or um, something that's related to school or soccer or life or family just so we can kind of we can just kind of connect with each other at that day and say you know we're all we're all still here and and we're all still um, we're all still human so 
and so we also talk through as we go through as we go through our our team meetings and our our leadership meetings um and i'll talk about our leadership group in a second um but uh we we use these with these character skills and and these character skills you know becky burley and and brett led better you know they're in there what drives winning is something that i've been um fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with and um obviously getting to coach with with becky over the years and and knowing uh the values that she puts into her team building and and um, team ownership as well and these are these are some of the things that we we talk to our team about and and really get them to understand that there are performance i think i think calling them, um, and relational skills now, um, that, that each player has and possesses and, and what are they good at and, and what do they need to work on and, and what do they, they want to share with their teammates. And I think those are things that we talk to our, our group about and, and really uh, motivate them to understand the differences in each other and how they can all work together. Um, and then we talked about some of the glossary and some of the uh, definitions um but but other thing that we do is is we don't necessarily have captains but we we have a leadership team and and typically the captain will come captain or captains will come from that leadership team and each year it's different um but we have representation from every from every uh classification in the in the spring season in our in our real season um in the fall we have representation from sophomores juniors and seniors because the freshmen aren't ready yet the freshmen just get there in august and they're still trying to figure out what's going on and so we add freshmen after the spring after they go through the leadership training and and in order to go through the leadership training you have to put in a put in a little application and it's not it's nothing dramatic it's just a short essay or short statement on why you want to be in the leadership team and so they put those in and then we go through some some leadership training throughout the spring season starting in january february and going through the season and then and then at that point we select that leadership team and um, this year this year we had um, six players on the leadership team out of 28 We've had as little as four. We've had as much as eight. Um, and it's, it's, there's no definitive number. It's just who we feel can really take hold of that role to really be that conduit between the players and the coaches and, and really help the group um, by motivating and pushing them um, from, from all leadership, leadership aspects. And so, you know, one of the things that we also do is I have a parent meeting. Actually, um, I started doing a parent meeting three, three, four years ago. And it was an idea that actually our baseball coach here at Ohio University, he had done. And, you know, I had never thought about doing a, a parent meeting in college because I was thinking, this is, this is college. This is college soccer. These are adult women and they should make their own decisions. And, you know, and then you forget that, um, that, uh, you know, most of the time parents are so influential, um, on their child, even when they're off in college. And so I wanted them to understand where we come from philosophically, where we come from, what their daughter is, is the environment that, that we're trying to create for their daughter to be in our program. And so, you know, a couple of the things just really quick that we talked to our, to our parents about again, is we, we really emphasize that we care for the player. Uh, I'm sorry for the, for the person, the daughter as the person greater than, than who they are as a player. And, um, you know, sometimes if, if they don't play a lot, they forget about that because they think, Oh, she doesn't, he doesn't like my daughter because she doesn't play. Um, but, but, they need to continue to recognize that we value each person most importantly. And, and so we, we let them know that the most important thing for us as a staff is that your daughter does not define her worth as a person by how much she plays or does not play. And your value as a parent is not determined by how much your daughter plays or doesn't play. It's how your daughter deals with adversity challenges, times of joy and times of disappointment. That is it. And a lot of times, you know, parents get wrapped up in, 
in, well, gosh, if my daughter plays, then she's amazing. If she doesn't play, well, I didn't do my job or, or whatever it is. And, and, and so it's so very important for them to recognize that, that really in life, how your daughter deals with adversity and challenges and times of joy and times of disappointment, because that's what we see every week as a student athlete, you're going to go through the range of emotions all the time. And so those are the most important things for us. And, and we go into talking about, you know, how, what we recommend and how we see the parent, um, child interaction through a season and how to communicate about soccer and how to communicate about school and you know we can't tell parents what to do but we we try to help them understand that we've been doing this a long time and we know and we can see what ways are best to support their child through these moments and so that's really important to us to to keep the parents in the loop and understand where we are and how we the environment that we create and then you know as a, as a head coach obviously having a staff um and obviously so many people you don't have to be in college you could high school club whatever it is you know it's so important to me again that when i have a staff that the that the assistants understand that you know who they are as, as a as a person is far more important than anything else and 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 that and for them to understand that I believe in them, you know, to give them ownership, to give them responsibility. So they know that it's not my program, it's our program. And, you know, what do we, what role do we allow them to do? And what role do they, do they take on and have ownership of? And what type of authority do they have? And then how much trust that I have in them and the implicit trust that, that I, that I give in them. And, and when we have that, then we're a cohesive group. And then, it, uh, and we're able to lead in a cohesive manner that the group understands that we're all in this together. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of it. I mean, that, that's kind of it in a nutshell of, of where, you know, the evolution of understanding the people first and then the player second and understanding that in order to get to that end product of winning games and, and to being successful, all these little details of caring for the person are most vital. Hmm. I think that's uh, some really fantastic stuff, uh, my friend. That I mean, just the the emphasis on the you know the the person, but the the psychological right that. And I love what you said. I mean, being a, a tactician of our game is important. Obviously, if you're working at the level you're working at, you have to have, you know, some level of, uh, you know, tactical ability, technical ability um, as a coach in terms of how you want to develop your team that way, uh, physically, whatever. But I think, you know, more and more, and it maybe just shows the evolution of how uh, student athletes have changed. And it's really about that relationship you build with them, you know, as a mentor, as a coach, as a friend, as a person that holds them accountable at times. Um, and I, the analogy that you used about being the bumpers, you know, on a bowling alley, um, I mean, you know, couldn't be more spot on. Uh, I, I love that. So one of the things I thought about in some of the, the folks I'm working with now in the club game have said this about the, the club that I'm at. And, you know, uh, I, I found it really interesting. Would you say that you know, Ohio women's soccer may not be for everybody, right? That there has to be a person that sort of, I don't want to say checks boxes, um, but there are some really powerful words, right? Empathetic, unselfish, um, mm -hmm. you know, I can go on and on um, from the PowerPoint. Um, you know, it, it's safe to say it may not be for everybody, right? And that's okay, um, because we've had that same conversation at the club I'm currently at, that what we are trying to do at the club quite truthfully may not be for everybody. And we're okay if a parent or a player says, Hey, you know what? Like, let's just shake hands and say, it was great meeting you. It's great, you know, getting to know you, but this might not be the best fit for what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you gotta, you, your philosophy and, and your structure is, is so vital that, that, 
that, that, that there are going to be people that may not believe in that or may not understand why you go through what you go through and, and may not understand that, you know, maybe some old school mentality coming in, like, well, freshmen should do this and freshmen should do that. Or, you know, you, you only need to, to train the top 11 players and focus all your energy on the top 12 or 13 players. And if, you know, uh, that, that, that's not what we do. I mean, we take everybody holistically and we want to, we want to build them up as much as we can. And, and we can't do that unless everybody buys into that, unless everybody understands that they are one piece of the puzzle and that cohesive puzzle is going to stay together and not fragment off if we all are strong and, and we all pull for each other as opposed to, you know, I mean, we all see teams that have an amazing player, but pull themselves aside or don't communicate well with the group or, or feel they may be above the group and, and they may be an amazing individual player, but they don't necessarily bring, bring that group and coalesce that group together. And that's something that is, is so vital for us. And, and I'm sure for, for you all in, in everything that you're building and trying to create a great foundation for. Mm-hmm. Uh, before I'll, for those listening, uh, <laughs> I'll share mine. Uh, you know, it, this is, this is show and tell, uh, here on this episode. Um, but, uh, how has it changed over time, Aaron, from, you know, when you first got into coaching to, um, you know, being, a, being a guy who, uh, you know, as, as the saying goes, it's not your first rodeo, right. When it comes to leading a program, um, you know, you've been a part of Ohio U here for a little while now and in the college game for a little while. How's it changed um, from when you first started? Well, I think when you first start, you know, and you're a competitive person, you, you, a lot of things that you do, you you kind of learned from the coaches that you had and and how you were coached or how you were trained. And, and so being a competitive person, an emotional person, uh, I would just want to win, just want to win. And I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, if you're not, if you're not working your tail off, if you're not sliding and jumping and sprinting all over the place, then you're not willing to work that hard. Then, then you, you just can't play. You can't play. We got to win. We got to go, 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 go. And as time goes on and, you know, and you kind of, you, you hold that high standard, uh, but you, you don't really develop that standard. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things that we've, that I have evolved in is, is that yes, working hard, training hard, pushing yourself is important, but if you don't choose to do that, if you don't intrinsically have that inside of you, it's never going to be valuable enough to be your best. You can have that transactional approach where if you don't do this, you're going to run. Well, that's not teaching somebody to decide for themselves because when you decide from yourself for yourself, it becomes so much more invested. You're so much more invested in the process as opposed to, well, I better do this because I don't really want to run. Well, do I really want to do the right thing or do I just want to act out of fear for doing the wrong thing? by by have not having to do the consequence and so yeah i mean i think consequences are important um and not everything that you can do in life in coaching can be so transformational there has to be some transactional product out there but getting players to understand that they want to do it because they have the desire to do it that's been the biggest thing and so much of that is is really understanding how to be relational and how to develop that relationship so that they see that you have their best interest. And so you're not just trying to use them to get to your end goal, but you're trying to help them get to their end goal. And I think that's probably not just coming with maturity and, and, and understanding and being a, a, a lifelong learner and understanding and willing to adapt and evolve, I think has been so vital. Did you ever uh, doubt yourself along the way? Right. So to get where you are now, um, and obviously I, I know your story probably better than, 
you know, maybe some folks listening to this, because as I've gotten to know you, uh, not only as a, you know, a, a friend, but as a, a coaching colleague, uh, et cetera. Um, but along the way, you know, did you, did you ever doubt yourself going, God, I, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Gosh, I probably do every day as it is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a never, it's an ever evolving journey. It's, um, I don't, every day I'm like, gosh, am I doing this right? I, I, I'm so critical of myself and everything that I do that every day I'm like, gosh, am I doing this right? Are they, are they receiving this message in the right way? Am I encouraging in them or am I, am I building them up? Or do some people feel like I'm, I'm, um, criticizing them? you know, every day I do. And I think, um, uh, you know, and, and then also too, when you, when you're trying to be more process oriented than outcome based, that if you start, if you're not winning games, you're like, man, is this the right way to do it? Should I go for the short term transactional approach or the short term, you just better get results today? Or should we take, you know, go be very um, bearish and go for long and go long? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that's kind of what, that's kind of what I've done. And, uh, I hope that it continues to work. Um, but you know, next year, the next game is only the next thing that we'll be judged by. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, something to be said for, uh, you know, one of the most successful seasons in Ohio U history, right? This past season. Right. So yeah. I think we're on the right path and, um, I think I think I'm saying this correctly that uh, every year, or maybe within the last four or five years, you've seen an increase in uh, you know an output in productivity in terms of uh, wins and losses. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe it is about playing that long game. So. Yeah. Um, I just I don't ever want to get caught up because because uh, soccer and results are never linear. And so they have been mm. linear for us. <laughs> they, oh, and you're right. For the last four years, they have been linear for us. And, and I just, you know, I don't want to get caught up in thinking, gosh, we've shown increase um, every year um, by, by a couple of games, couple of games, couple of games, couple of games. And so I don't want to make sure that next year, if we don't have that couple of games, mm -hmm. <laughs> linear growth and no, like, no oh, pressure geez. for the new yeah. class coming yeah, in. Next exactly. Year. Exactly. No, no pressure. <laughs> exactly. Good. Oh my gosh. All right. Here we go. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, people watching this, obviously not as, uh, as fancy as your nice PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, I my. like the PowerPoint. Yeah. So, um, you know, for me, I think it, it comes down to the, the four pillars of the game and, um, uh, you know, maybe a, a slightly different approach, but I, you know, maybe I think something for me that I probably could, um, uh, you know, delve deeper into is, is probably the psychological and continuing to evolve, you know, in that area, but all four areas, you know, for that matter. Um, so uh, I want my teams to know that the most valuable thing on a football pitch is the, the ball itself. Uh, if we do not have that ball, um, then the chances of us winning that game um, are obviously greatly decreased. I uh, want my teams to possess the ball and attack with patience and precision and moving through the thirds while starting with our first striker, uh, which is our goalkeeper. So we're going to do a lot of building from the back um, and we're going to play with poise. We're going to play with confidence. Um, there's going to be like, quite a bit of movement. Um, it, you know, some people would say it's going to look like pretty soccer um, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, when my teams lose the ball, uh, we go into a win it back mode by pressing the opponent into making mistakes. And it's an instantaneous, it's our cue. Um, we immediately recognize it and, um, you know, we want that ball back as, as quickly as possible. Um, I want my teams to play with tenacity. I want them to play with an edge. And um, for folks that know um, a little bit about me that, you know, players like Clint Dempsey, Players like an Abby Wambach, a Hope Solo, um, you know, uh, Megan Rapino, some of the current, um, you know, U.S. women's players, maybe some former U.S. men's players, even Sergio Ramos. <laughs> I know a lot of people dislike him, but he plays with an edge. 
and I want to go right up against the line, uh, but I never want to go over that line. So I want to be a thorn in the opponent's side um, if we can, and that way they get off their game. Um, I want my teams to battle and play smart. I want them to play intelligent football. And what that comes down to is, you know, unforced errors or self-inflicted wounds, really. Um, I value and we value as a team a high football IQ. Um, I want my teams to understand and employ proper technique um, and what that actually looks like and situationally what technique might be required for the situation that they're in. I want my teams to value and understand what goes into making their body transform just from being a soccer player to actually being a footballer. So um, for me, you know, that hits technical, tactical, psychological in terms of mindset, and then the physical part. So how we achieve that, virtually everything we do um, in training is a rondo of some sort. We are consistently looking for numerical advantages. Um, that is truly our oxygen um, when we're on the pitch. Possession, attacking philosophy drives everything. Can I create a training session that will replicate what they would see in a match? So, and I'll touch on this at the end, how my I think evolution as a coach has happened. Uh, I was probably really good at one time of putting a collection of drills together that had no rhyme or reason that didn't go back to a philosophy, that didn't go back to an idea, that didn't go back to this sort of overarching game-like, you know, uh, concept that I want to create. And was when I had this moment where I realized that it needs to look like what they're going to see in a game. So that goes to repetition and understanding time and space. So we train at tempo, we train with purpose, high intensity, um, focus, uh, high intensity and focus for me uh, and for our players are non-negotiable. Um, those are the two things that we ask for each and every player um, that I'm coaching. We talk about mentality and what's needed to play this way every chance we get. So that's during coaching breaks, that's during water breaks, that's a team talk at halftime or after a game, before a training session, when players arrive at the end of a training session. Um, we're training them to be hunters and to have that hunter's type of mindset. Um, some people might call it a shark uh, mentality. We create a culture that is demanding, but not demeaning. So the expectations, some people would say, might be a little out of their ballpark uh, or might be a little bit high, but we never they're never about the person. It's never about a personal attack on somebody. It's never about, um, uh, you know, uh, if uh, we have a conversation with a parent, everybody plays an equal part in this, if, even if they're not, you know, seeing time on the pitch. We give praise. We say thank you. We acknowledge good work when it happens. I mean, we really make a big deal about good work when we see it. We also own our mistakes, and myself included. So that could be in training. That could be in a match. That could be in how I talk to a player, how I handled a situation to show that, um, it is not an authoritarian uh, type of regime. Um, I'm human, I make mistakes. My coaching colleagues make mistakes. But to know when we do that and to say, you know, I'm sorry, and to own our mistake if we, if we make it. And last but not least, uh, we eat, sleep, and breathe football. And so I think for me, um, you know, it, that has evolved and I touched a little uh, on it a little bit earlier that I think at a, a period of my life where I was probably really good at, you know, putting a collection of drills together, but they didn't have a rhyme or reason. It wasn't about, it was a very short term, you know, I'm trying to get something out of this group. And I think, um, you know, was sort of writing these things down and actually putting them you know, in a, in a Word document, that it, it makes me think about what am I like at a training session? What am I like during a match? Um, how do I talk to players? You know, that sort of thing. So I'm sort of like a, um, I don't know, I, I guess I would describe it sort of like that, you know, that killer instinct. I, I can be emotional at times, but generally speaking, that isn't sort of my demeanor. 
And I think that whatever the situation calls for, you know, I can sort of accelerate, or de- you know, decelerate if I need to, to get a team going or, you know, sort of bring a team back to reality. Um, but that comes through repetition, that comes through practice, um, that comes through failure, that comes through, um, I think, talking to people and interacting with people that have differing views of how the game should be played and how we're trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. And I think that, um, you know, something that I had shared recently was constantly being challenged to be better in everything that I do from the minute that I leave the house to the minute that I return of thinking, you know, reflecting, um, preparing mentally, emotionally, being adaptable, those sort of things. And that comes with practice that comes with, um, you know, uh, just the, the longer you do this, the, the more comfortable, um, you know, you, you get, uh, to, to do these sort of things. And, yeah. So, so that's me. Um, so I, how do you, so when you, when you talk through that stuff and you, you talk about kind of the, the tactical framework and in your club, do you, how do you present that to different age groups? Are you, do you guys do different age groups and we do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, right. There has to be a sort of evolutionary pathway, right. And that it has to, um, in, in my opinion, in my experience, they have to be able to see it and what it would actually look like in a game or mm-hmm. in a match so they can then begin applying the concepts. So uh, I'll give an example. Um, last night we were working with a, a futsal group and we were doing some, some 1v1 work and that they were playing to, to two, to, uh, two different goals at the, at the halfway line the entry point for the two players was different than what I had seen, um, you know, uh, compared to other one V ones that I've done where the emphasis was really on the actual, you know, taking a player on trying to beat a player, that sort of thing. The emphasis in this particular one V one was where the player was actually receiving the ball, then making the decision. So fast forward to the end of the, the session. So we be, were playing a, a scrimmage it replicated almost a hundred percent where they would start if we're trying to build from the back and what, you know, what their first touch on the ball would look like. Um, And, you know, quite truthfully, I didn't initially see that connection, but once it was explained to me, um, you know, it, it made sense. So it's then building off of that. And uh, the, I I think the, the really, just the the really cool thing uh, about the club is that, you know, there is a very strong emphasis on development. Every club in America will say that they develop kids, Mm -hmm. but when they truly own it and say, you know what, we do not care about score lines. We know we're going to concede goals if we try to build from the back. However, this is how we want to play. And so we will suffer, you know, short-term losses for long-term game uh, games. Mm -hmm. And that, um, it, it, you know, and, and for the players, when they get in this mindset and when they begin to understand what is expected and needed of them, there is a, a pretty significant jump. And the, the great thing is that that club philosophy drives every level, right? Kids that are playing, you know, at, at a high school age level, kids that are in a middle school age level and on down, and actually all the way to the first team, you know, for, for both the men's and women's side, that that's how the men's and women's first teams are playing. So if you pluck a kid out uh, who's high school age and would be eligible to play for the men's or women's first team, they could step right in and they understand, you know, what they're trying to accomplish and why they want to mm-hmm. go through the thirds and, and that sort of thing. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, a- absolutely. And, you know, obviously the older that the players get, there's going to be more numbers on the pitch. There's going to be, um, you know, how, how do you structure it? You know, those sort of things, but the, the, the principles and the philosophy and the, the game like, um, emphasis is still there. And I think that's, um, you know, I don't want to say it's sort of had an aha moment when I kind of thought of it that way, but definitely, a I think an evolution for me 
um, you know, as a coach for sure. I think it's really good too. I mean, to have that, to have that structure throughout. And, and as you said, you're creating a full, I know pathway and from the very beginning through to a senior level. And obviously that's very important in that whole club structure and that club identity. And, uh, and that's really important. And obviously as you develop the younger ones, that technical aspect of the game or the technical ability individually is, is a massive input of a massive importance because in order to be able to build out, to be able to play under pressure, to be able to play with pressure uh, at a quicker speed and a quicker pace of play, you got to be proficient technically. And that's, I'm sure that that's something that from five, six, seven years old, mm -hmm. is something that's, that's so important to, to you all. And, and also U S soccer creating the build out line is, mm -hmm something that's that's so uh instrumental probably in creating that confidence mm -hmm. to be able to say i can play short and build up so without having to say well i'm just going to smash it down the field because right. i'm gonna immediately going to be put under pressure and not have the confidence or the opportunity to develop that that mentality or mindset for sure yeah well so taking that idea of pressure right and when a player, um, when a defender puts pressure on an attacking player. So it, it is really interesting and, and absolutely fascinating to me as a coach to see how players respond to that. Um, all the way from, you know, uh, the U8, U10 level, all the way up through the high school uh, level that I've worked with. And, you know, even watching college games, professional games. Um, and so, you know, make a, make a comparison or, or parallel to life, right? There's a great teachable moment that when a player is struggling, right? So there's the philosophy and what we're trying to accomplish, but maybe they're failing at it. There's a great coaching moment that I've found to pull a player aside and say, you know, there's going to be times in life, numerous times in life where you're under pressure, right? It's going to look a little different than a defender coming right at you or trying to, you know, press you high or something like that. So for them understanding that there are some life lessons to be learned, um, and you know, quite truthfully, I mean, um, I, 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 I like coaching soccer, so I'm not, um, you know, I've coached so many different age groups that, um, you know, I, I enjoy all of them a little bit differently. I think that message is probably high school players and, and probably older have the, the analytical reasoning ability to understand what that actually means and looks like. Mm -hmm it's putting it in the right terminology for a U8 or U10 player that they could understand what that actually means. Mm -hmm. And quite truthfully, showing support that, cause you know that they're going to make mistakes. You know what I mean? I, I, heck, my high school kids make mistakes all the time. Um, so it's letting them know that there is unwavering support, even if they are failing, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And that failure is something that is, welcomed and appreciated because to me that shows a willingness to learn and a willingness to take chances and risks and just this sort of you know evolutionary process that goes on um you know for for a young player so yeah i'm trying to find um yeah john i was talking about john wooden earlier about um being a great teammate and not necessarily a great player another one of his famous quotes is if you're not making mistakes, then you're not doing anything. I'm positive that a doer makes mistakes. And I mean, that right there is, is one of the greatest coaches of all time. Yeah. You know, you, you're going to make mistakes. You, you're going to, and the more you put yourself in a situation where you can overcome those, those challenges, you're going to make mistakes, but it's going to become fewer and fewer and fewer because you're facing those on a daily or on a, daily basis or in a, on a minute by minute basis or, or whatever it might be in, in a, in a game situation, in a practice situation, in a life situation, you know, those are things that you got to be a doer. Mm -hmm. And if you're not a doer, then you're not going to make any mistakes, but you're not going to accomplish anything either. Yeah. Well, I, I think something that, you know, so there's obviously a, a wide variance of, of coaches that listen to this from, you know, uh, coaches that may only train their players twice a week or three times a week, Whereas, you know, you look at situations like a fall season, right? For you, for me, 
I mean, we're around these players a lot. <laughs> um, I mean, so you'd know a lot about them, right? Probably in some cases more than you care to know. Mm. Um, and so it's this weird, you know, sort of family construct and weird sort of, you know, I, I always thought of it, Aaron, as, you know, from the, the moment that I would get out of my car um, to, to go to training this past fall, I mean, one, it's an opportunity, but two, there are so many touch points that I could have with a player, right? It's from the moment they arrive, you know, like you said, it could be a handshake. It could be, you know, uh, how, how was your, you know, how was your math test today um, or, or something like that, or just something you notice about them. You know, I tend to be a, a pretty observant coach, right? And had a couple guys on my team this past year that, you know, they love to buy new boots and that they would show up like, seems like every third week with like a new pair of boots on. So of course, you know, I, I'm a shoe guy. Um, I would notice these things and I would comment on those things and, you know, ask them if they want to sell me their old boots. <laughs> but, uh, um, but it, you know, it's those little things, right. That they may not even know that we notice um, or they're, you know, they're talking, maybe they're playing some music or something while, you know, we're warming up or, you know, they're, they're kind of stretching out or, or whatever. It's just those little things that sort of endear you, you know, to, to them as a, as a coach and as a person. Um, and I, I, you know, there's a moment. So uh, one of my players, um, one of the high school players, he was waiting for practice, you know, waiting for our training session to start after school. And he was sitting, um, there was a little bit of a gap from when their school day ended to when we actually trained. So I think he had gone home and his mom brought him back. He wasn't old enough to drive. And he was actually sitting in his mom's Honda CRV. And so I, there I am. I got a bag of balls. I got my backpack, got all my stuff for training. I walk over to him. Now, this is one of our freshmen who, I mean, the kid literally wouldn't, you know, say boo <laughs> if he was in a haunted house to like scare somebody. I mean, you know, he, he was a sort of a, a timid and kind of a, a shy young man. And I went over and I said to him, I told him, you know, put the window down his little sister's in the back seat. mom's driving. And I said to him, I won't say his name, but I looked at him and I looked at his mom and I said, I'm so proud of how you've been playing lately because when I first met you, you literally wouldn't say boo to anybody. You know what I mean? I couldn't even get you to say anything. And so, you know, trying to judge and get a feel of the temperature of the room was really challenging for him. But as he got more comfortable, as he saw sort of this positive reinforcement, yet sort of a, a higher standard than he had been used to, um, you know, and he smiled and uh, mom was greatly appreciative of the, the compliment or, or whatever. And so, you know, it, it, was, it was really just great to see that player continue to grow. Again, it's touch points, right? Could I have gone just right on the field and set up you know, my stuff and got my bag of balls and all my personal stuff and water bottles and whatever. Absolutely. Again, there's an opportunity, make the most of the opportunity. So not to say that that's the only way to do it. Um, but in that particular instance, um, you know, was, I think, impactful for that young man, for his family. And, you know, and the other thing too, it's about the long game. It goes exactly back to what you said that, you know, I'm going to rely on this person. <laughs> you know, I, this isn't like a one shot deal where it's like, okay, you're going to have a different coach and you're going to be on to something else or, you know, whatever. I mean, there is a relationship being formed here that, you know, coming back as a sophomore, the expectations and what we need from him are going to be higher. You know, it's, laying that foundation with the player that they can come back and have that confidence already instilled in them to then take it and amplify it, you know, even louder. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. A, and I think coaching where coaching at a level where you graduate people on, I mean, even club soccer or high school soccer or college soccer, you know, you, you create those relationships, you create, you create that connection and and then when they're gone every year i i go into a postseason depression because i'm sad that 
that senior class I don't get to see anymore from a coaching standpoint, obviously, yeah. um, from a relational, you know, hopefully we'll be able to stay in connection with our players for, for a long time and, and mentor and see them mentor others. But it is uh, being able to create that relationship and those touch points with people that you can play that long game. So you understand from freshman until senior that uh, you're creating something and you're preparing them to help prepare them to be, to be the best that they can be. And Mm -hmm. then they're going to mentor those below them and continue to create that environment, create that foundation and that culture that that we all want to serve each other and, Mm -hmm. and, and not look to see what you can, what you can get out of the opportunity, but what you can give to the opportunity. Yeah. Very well said. Uh, I'll put this in the show notes, but uh, go ahead, Aaron, plug uh, the Ohio U program. And if people want to connect and reach out to you on social media, uh, how can they do that? Oh, well, um, Ohio W soccer is our, is the Twitter. Um, Ohio soccer coach is my personal Twitter. And um, we have a Facebook page. Uh, Instagram is Ohio W soccer as well. And uh, that's where you can see all good and and wonderful things about Ohio women's soccer and listen to me talk about our program and personal and individual anecdotes of, of what, how, what, and I feel that, uh, that we're going through as a team. So, well, you're the, uh, the official women's soccer team of this podcast. So, um, yes. you know, I, I don't know <laughs> other than like a high five or, uh, you know, job well done gold star on the, uh, you know, the, the chore chart, um, you know, what that actually gets you guys. But, um, for, for anybody listening to this that hasn't watched you play, I, I can say just from my own eyes, um, following along closely, they play a very attractive brand of soccer and that if you're looking for a collegiate team to root for or get behind, um, I would say they're a great one to do it. And, um, you know, these are people that are playing in your local communities. These are people that, um, you know, uh, have a chance to go on and and play at a a really high level. So the, the fact that, um, you know, what you've done with the program, it's awesome. And, and I had texted you this before, but I, I genuinely believe it. And, you know, we, we were obviously super busy during the fall season, so we didn't talk quite as much. But the fact of how much your team enjoyed being around each other, I, I picked that up instantly. And how I look at it, you know, through the lens that I do, obviously, is a little bit different than, you know, just casual person off the street. But that was an immediate observation that I had. Um, and again, it goes back to everything that you talked about. Right. And so that's taken time. That's taken, what is it? Year seven, eight now. Um, seven, yeah. yeah. You know, to, to get to that point, but it doesn't matter if, you know, if it's your, your best player, quote unquote, best player or the last, you know, lady on the roster, everybody knows their value in place. And, um, and, and I, I say that because early on in the season, right? Your starting keeper went down, Mm -hmm. your backup keeper steps in a a local gal here from the Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh area performed admirably. (laughs) Um, and you guys were, uh, you know, you had a fantastic start to the season. So, you know, uh, I mean, it's the old cliche and sort of line that, you know, one play away from, from making an impact, but, um, you know, players always have to be ready. And I think that, you know, some people would say next man up or next woman up or or whatever, but it's, that's what a team is. You know, the, the whole is greater than the, the sum of the parts. So. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's something that, that we strive to do. And, and again, you know, playing this long game because, you know, I want to make sure that every single one of the players on our roster feels valued and it's hard because so many people in, in all walks of life, they, they define themselves by their playing time. And we have 28 people, we had 28 players on our roster this last season. 
And, you know, players in the realm, a number, you know, from 22 to 28, they, they don't really play in games. And, and how do we keep them engaged? How do we keep them understanding that they are just as valuable to our group as the player that plays every minute? And we can't do it without them. And so it's not easy. It is a challenge and it is a never ending challenge to make sure because not everybody understands that. And, you know, and everybody keeps telling me, well, you can't make everybody happy. You can't make everybody happy. And I keep telling them, well, Dad Gummit, I'm sure going to try. I'm going <laughs> to try to make everybody happy because I feel like, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to be in the boat in the situation that we're in. And, and even if you don't play, you can still add such a huge value to, to our group. And, and, you know, our, our players do enjoy being around each other. And I, and it is, it is funny because, you know, that's a very precarious place to be because it can go one or two ways because they can love to be around each other so much that they don't ever want to push each other because mm -hmm. they don't want to tick each other off or they can love to be around each other so much that they really appreciate each other pushing, pushing each other to be your best. And, and so that's the, that's the balance that we have to find. And so we're always kind of balancing that. Are we, do we like each other too much like a sorority or do we like each other too much? And we're going to as competitors and teammates and we're going to push each other to be, to be your best. And so got to keep, got to keep, uh, keep an eye on that all the time. Yeah, no, good stuff, man. And uh, this has been fun. Um, not only for me, just to, you know, th these are things that I think about all the time, right? I have a, a little bit of a drive to training, um, not as long for the high school team, but anytime I'm in my car, listening to other podcasts, whatever I'm doing, you know, out for a run, I think about these things. And this is, you know, people say, you know, what do you do or whatever? I mean, it's truly the art and the science of coaching mm -hmm. and how incredibly hard it is. And I, you know, I, I chuckle, I saw something on Twitter, I think it was earlier today, you know, that they said that uh, someone had commented that um, yeah, I'm with this group for an hour a week, you know, rec coach or whatever, how hard can it be? <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Um, yeah. You know, and you and I and others, um, uh, you know, when you're around players that much, you know, uh, sometimes you, you need a little space from each other. Sometimes you need to know when to put the pedal down. Sometimes you need to know when to ease off. Um, you know, like you said, it's the sorority example. I mean, you nailed it. So. Yeah, I was going to share. Um, I was going to share one more thing. And uh, you, you were talking about um, talking about the uh, how easy it is to, to coach or how easy it is to do things. You talk about some tweets. There was a couple of tweets, and this is part of the conversation that we had with our team today. You know, it, it's pretty easy to understand what you need to do to be your to be your very best. This is a tweet that I got off um, Twitter last year. Everyone, quote, unquote, wants it, but few are willing to change behaviors to get it. Basic requirements are a higher level of commitment, action plans, and willingness to push beyond your comfort level. Well, you know what? No crap. We all got that. We can mm -hmm. figure that out. We know what it takes. But do you understand why you are going to do that? Yeah. I think that, that's it. Teach, telling the players what they need to do is one thing getting them to understand why they should do it and why and do they want to do it is a whole nother thing. And again, that's the art and science of being able to push people to be their best. Yeah. I'll end with this, that um, you said a really powerful three letter word, why. And we work with a generation of players and this is, you know, inevitably it's, it's going to change as with, you know, every generation, they need to know the why they want to know the why mm -hmm. they've been wired to know the why. And I, I see it in my own children, right? Um, you know, my, my, my three-year-old daughter asked me why all the time <laughs> I have high school kids asking me, coach, why do I need to do that? So 
either one, I'm making it up on the fly, which I really don't like doing parent parenting 101 there. Uh, or, um, you know, I, I've thought about the why I've actually kind of did a deep dive into the why. So when I, you know, I tell my teams, we want to play from the back and they look at me and they go, well, we've never played this way before. Every other coach we've worked with has never done this. So why are we doing this? I can actually explain that to them, you know, but, um, yeah, it's easy to, to get pushback to that. I think, and it's easy to, you know, sometimes be at a loss for words, right? So, I mean, it, it comes with that adaptability and that, yeah, for anyone that says that, like, they've made it as a coach, you know, even the most successful coaches, you know, I'll, I'll use Nick Saban uh, at Alabama, right? I mean, <laughs> it blows my mind when they've literally won a national championship. And like, he can't wait to get the interviews over so he can start preparing for the next season. Mm -hmm. That tells me somebody that is, I mean, he's crazy, but (laughs) obsessed in a good way, perhaps. I mean, his wife would probably say he's nuts, but, um, you know, obsessed with that. And that, um, you know, you can't just show up and go through the motions and players see right through you. So Mm -hmm. anyway, I'm on my my soapbox here in high horses. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, so we'll cut things there and, um, yeah, man, thank you so much for, for the time. That was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Enjoy doing it.